What's up y'all, it's Shuffle, and we're going to do a Crimson Court Guide today, so if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Before we get started, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, all of the normal YouTube stuff, check out the box below for Discord, Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon. There goes all of the plugging stuff within 15 seconds. This guide will attempt to cover everything related to Crimson Court, only going in depth when it really needs to, and I will point you to other resources that can be helpful, such as the maps for the static missions on the wiki. First off, what is Crimson Court? What comes with it when you buy this DLC? Well, first of all, you get Flagellant, which is a very cool new class. He's included with it. You get a new area called the Courtyard, and then you get a slew of new monsters and trinkets to deal with. The other mainstay of the DLC is an effect called the Crimson Curse, which we'll talk about here in a second. And it can be very annoying for new players, but once you get a handle on it, it's actually kind of an upside. At least for anyone that isn't a support unit. The nice part about the Crimson Court DLC is it adds something to do in the mid-game of Darkest Dungeon, which is usually kind of a slog as you're trying to level up from about 2 to 5, and that's usually where Crimson Court has its biggest impact. If you are a new player, I don't recommend turning on Crimson Court right away just because you're going to be learning the base game, which has a lot of information already that you have to deal with, and then you add Crimson Court on top of it, which has its own unique mechanics, and the monsters are more challenging than vanilla monsters, so if you are wanting to play Crimson Court, I would recommend finishing the game at least once, and then either starting a new file with it, because it's better to start a file and then do it alongside the other stuff, or start it on your completed file just so you have a very easy time of handling it. The added class of Crimson Court is Flagellant. I already made a Flagellant guide if you're interested, so I'll make sure to link that with the video. But the short end of playing Flagellant is just give him Punish, Reign of Sorrows, Exsanguinate, and then usually either Reclaim or Redeem. Those four moves, or like some combination of four of those five moves, will get you through most content pretty easily. You can use Suffer and Endure, but they're a little more tricky and tougher to understand. Flagellant himself matches up very well against all the Crimson Court enemies. I think this was by design. So if you need to put one unit in each of your Crimson Court teams, make it Flagellant, he's going to do just fine. So how do we activate Crimson Court once the DLC is active on the file? So you check the box, and then once you open your game, you will eventually get a town event called The Town is a Buzz. If you're starting a new file, this should happen, I think, at week 3, something like that, maybe 4 or 5. And this town event will replace all town events that you can possibly get unless it is something that is specific that is supposed to happen, such as Wolves at the Door, or giving you your first Shield Breaker, or Flagellant if you have those DLCs enabled. This also has the added penalty of reducing all passive stress healing your units accrue while in town. Normally you get 10 stress healed each week that a person doesn't go on a mission, or spend time in a facility, and this lowers it down to 5, so it can actually be pretty irritating to say the least. But don't get it twisted, you probably shouldn't hit this the moment you see this town event. All it's doing is signifying to you that the courtyard quest is ready, and you can do it when you're ready. Crimson Curse is the main mechanic that you have to deal with in the DLC. Whenever one of your units gets hit by a certain attack, usually it involves the attacking unit trying to drink your blood. Once you get hit by that, you have a small chance of getting the Crimson Curse. This is based on your disease resist. And Crimson Curse is interesting because it can be annoying at first. It takes a new resource, you have to drink blood to keep your units alive. And they have different stages of the curse, which I'll show on screen. So if you want to pause the video to read it real quick, you can. But most importantly is Bloodlust, because Bloodlust is a massive damage spike, and that's pretty nice, which is why we sometimes jokingly refer to it as Crimson Upside. Once you've opened the courtyard and some time has passed, you'll have to deal with something called Infestation. You can check the level of infestation for your estate by looking at the banner on the left side of your screen, that is the courtyard banner, and as it fills up in red color and gets more flies around it, or I guess mosquitoes, it gets more intense, and it shows you if it's at none, low, medium, or high. As this fills up, the occurrence of courtyard enemies in your regular missions also increases in proportion to it. So when it's low, you're going to fight regular courtyard enemies pretty rarely. Once it's medium, you'll fight them pretty commonly. And then once it's high, you're going to fight them very commonly. And they're also cocoons that you can open. The cocoons are important because they spawn gatekeepers, which drop invitations, which are what you need to fight the bosses in courtyard. The thing that you need to be most aware of involving infestation is once your estate hits medium infestation. You will know you've reached medium because you get a town event that shows that the fanatic has appeared and he'll be in town for one week and then after you see him in town he'll become a roaming boss. And the fanatic is incredibly dangerous but we'll talk about him later. If you want to make infestation go away you have to go to the courtyard, you have to do the epic mission there and you have to kill the current boss that has spawned. This will either be Baron, Viscount or Countess. Once you have defeated them, the infestation will leave your state, and all of your characters will lose Crimson Curse until the next boss decides to show up and start infesting your estates. 
It's also important to note that imitations do not carry over between bosses. You cannot farm 10 imitations when Baron's active and then use them to beat every other boss that comes after him. Instead, if you get a Baron invitation, it only works for Baron. If you get a Viscount invitation, it only works for Viscount, and the same with Countess. The final note about invitations is you should not need more than maybe five to clear these, unless you really just have some bad luck or bring some bad teams, because, you know, it's your first time. But you're also watching this guide, so I'm assuming you're looking for help. So you shouldn't need more than five invitations to clear each boss. So don't go out of your way to farm 14 of them just to be Baron. There are three types of courtyard missions. The first one is gathering blood in the courtyard. This is pretty nice to refuel your hamlet with blood because you usually get about like 8 to 18 of them. Usually about three stacks per run and that's really good. This can keep your town going for a while so even if you're running low on blood you can do one or two of these missions and you're stocked up for a very long time. That's pretty cool. There are four preset dungeons that you have to deal with. The first dungeon when you have the town is a buzz event is set. It's always the same dungeon, which is why I suggest a map. And then the dungeons for Baron, Viscount, and Countess are also the same every single time. The final type of mission that appears in the courtyard is after you beat Countess. So after that, there is a repeatable boss called the Garden Guardian, and every time you beat it, it drops, I think, one court trinket for beating it, and then there's one as the reward. So you have to farm this dude about, I don't know, so many times, like 12 times after you clear the other content just to make sure you can fill out all of the courtyard sets. I don't recommend doing this unless you just want to keep playing on a file you've already completed everything on just to collect everything, but if you're trying to do some kind of short-term challenge like beating the game on Blood Moon or, I don't know, Torchless or whatever, I don't recommend doing this just because it eats up a lot of time. Before I forget, here are the curio that appear in Courtyard and what you need to activate them safely. If you want to pause the video and take some notes or make some kind of screenshot, then now's a good time to do it. This section of the video is going to talk about team building and items for Crimson Court. And in the background, again, if you want to pause and look at it, I'm going to show what trinkets are good and then which ones are also bad in terms of what you can get from the neutral pool. And there are a couple of trinkets I want to talk about specifically. The two best neutral trinkets from Crimson Court are the Dazzling Mirror and Mercurial Salve. The mirror is really good because you get 4 extra speed against courtyard enemies, which is very good. A lot of the courtyard enemies are pretty fast, especially mosquitoes. So if they're really annoying you, just give your dazzling mirror to someone like Plague Doctor. She's usually going to go first, or she has a really good chance to do it, and then she can stun stuff and lock it down. But other characters can make use of the mirror as well, such as Bounty Hunter, Occultist, and Vestal. The other trinket is the Mercurial Salve. This is your pretty much Bloodsucker Bane trinket. It's 25% bonus damage against Crimson Courtyard enemies. This thing is fantastic. Anyone who is supposed to be dealing damage on your team, so your biggest damage dealer, like Leper or Hellion or Highwayman, they should be getting the cell because they need to be doing the most damage and this helps them do that. As for the rest of the trinkets, they honestly suck, except for maybe Sanguine Snuff's okay because that's a lot of crit and dodge for a certain time. Otherwise, a lot of the courtyard sets for the characters are pretty good. They all have their upsides and downsides, it's too much to talk about in this short video, so look at my trinket tier list if you're interested, because I talk about all of them there. And the boss trophies for Courtyard are pretty lackluster, the only decent one is the Baron's Lash, because it's just basically 4 speed, but otherwise, like the Countess Fan and the Viscount Spices, both those are pretty bad. For teams in Courtyard, a lot of teams work, surprisingly. I think every character has something to do in Courtyard where they're good. Even Plague Doctor is pretty good. This is someone that, when Courtyard first came out, a lot of people thought she sucked just because she couldn't blight half the enemies because they have really high blight resist. But it turns out if you just give her a Dazzling Mirror, she can stun all the big threats there and then she can give Emboldening Vapors, which is her damage up move on units during boss fights. So like I said, a lot of teams work here as long as you can just give yourself a bit of reach and recovery. So pretty much all of your normal team building types of stuff. But to close out this section, we're going to talk about three teams specifically. The first one is Plague Doctor, Jester, Occultist, and Leper. That's the order from left to right. This team seems a bit frail on paper, but it has a lot of recovery, it has a lot of defensive measures in stuns, and you have Battle Ballad for Leper, which is just great, and then Leper can handle all of your damage needs for this team. This team is not my creation, but it's the team that Thick proposed to me, and he said he got it from Karyu, so shoutouts where shoutouts are due. And this team is really strong in Courtyard. Its best strength is the fact that it can control the entire battle, by stunning stuff all over the place, Occultists can double or triple stun things, Plague Doctor with Blasphemous File and Mirror, she can double stun things, so when we talk about double stunning, that means repeatedly stunning an enemy even though it gets stun resist for recovering. 
And then you have healing potential from a couple characters, you have Leper Self Heal, and then you have Jester with Inspiring Tune to help you with stress. The stun from Occultus, which normally carries a minus torch penalty, does not exist in Courtyard because the place is always considered high torch. It's always considered Radiant Light, so all of your light gear will work here, such as Ancestor's Candle and Sun Ring. And it may take some getting used to, but this team does very well. The easiest way to explain how it plays is that Jester uses Ballad on turn 1 to boost everyone on the team, and then you have Plague Doctor and Occultus stun everything they can just to slow it down, and then Leper starts ripping into whatever he can hit and kill within 1 or 2 turns. Once you've eliminated the big threats, even if you're still left with something like a Chevalier, which is a very dangerous enemy normally, you can just spam Intimidate and Weakening Curse on it just so it does no damage once it hits you. Between the enemies hitting you for literally tickle damage at like 3 or 5 points a turn, even if they hit you with a Bleed or Blight on top of that, Plague Doctor can cure it, and then everyone can just drop their respective heal when they have a chance to, and that lets you recover and stall while not getting reinforcements because you're at least doing a little bit of damage with Weakening Curse and Intimidate. It sounds a bit confusing at first, and I know a lot of people don't like stall gameplay, but honestly, if you want to one-week some of these dungeons and not take, you know, three to five invitations to beat them, then this is the kind of stuff you have to do. Another incredibly safe team for handling any courtyard situation that isn't Crocodilian for the most part, and I guess the courtyard bosses themselves as well, so just pretty much all the bosses, is Vestal, Jester, Flagellant, and Hellion. The combination of these four has an incredible amount of recovery between Flagellant's ability to heal people with a couple different skills, Jester with his stress healing, Vestal with her consistent healing output and stuns, and then you have Hellion to carry your damage. This team really doesn't get thrown off its game outside of like a couple crits and disruption like in Raging Slight. So if you're looking for something very straightforward and easy to play, this is the team I would suggest. Like I said, it's pretty straightforward, so most of the time you just drop Reign of Sorrows on turn 1, use Balb with Jester, Vessel stuns something, and then Hellion uses If It Bleeds or Iron Swan to clean up the easiest thing that she can hit. Once that's done, between a combination of Punish and Bleed Out, you're going to rip through the last two or three dudes in a couple turns. My final team suggestion doesn't really have a backline with it, it's just the front two characters are pretty good. So you have Shieldbreaker and Highwayman, or even a second Shieldbreaker. This is just because the ability for Shieldbreaker to hit everything with Pierce or Puncture to disrupt things and block, like all that is really good. She can also move around, she can handle being moved. Highwayman can get a lot of value out of her post because there are a couple cleave attacks. There are valuable targets at any spot, which is what Highwayman's good at. He can hit anything that he wants to. And then he also has her post on top of Open Bane. For a duo like this, all you have to do is slap a couple people behind them that are good enough to keep them alive. So you can use Jestel if you want to, the Vestal Jester combination. You can use Arbalest, you can use Occultus, you can use Crusader, a lot of units work here. Now it's time to talk about the enemies that appear in Courtyard. There are a lot of specific enemies that appear, the Bloodsuckers, but there are a couple ones that appear that you wouldn't expect, like Ghoul and the Big Worms and the Small Worms from the Warrens. The ones that can appear in other areas besides Courtyard are the Supplicants, the Sycophants, which are also called Mosquitoes, Gatekeepers, and Chevaliers. The Courtyard exclusive ones are Manservant, Courtesan, and Esquire. Mosquitoes are pretty annoying, they're evasive, they're fast, they do stuns and stress and curse you, and they also have a bleed attack once they transform. But once you have some decent accuracy and some heavy hitters, they go down in two hits. Supplicants, aka the tick heads, are pretty harmless for the most part. Like once you're cursed, they don't really do much besides hit you with a solid blight attack. So usually if you need to take a turn to stall or just slow the fight down, since these guys are stunning me and you just let them, you know, blight you and heal it up and do all the other healing you need, and then just kill them when you need to. Manservants are pretty interesting because they do a lot for the enemy team. They can do guards, they can disrupt you with enraging slight, they can give you the curse, they have an ability once they transform that lets them guard the entire team, which is pretty crazy. And on top of all that, they're pretty fast and evasive. These should usually die first in most enemy encounters. Esquire is a pretty distinctive unit. It is a noble looking person that's very slender, and it has a rapier and a gun. The threat level on this enemy depends on where it's at in the enemy position. If it's in the back, the threat level is very high because of the attack it can use, and if it's in the front, then the threat level is very low, and you can pretty much just ignore it. The reason it's so dangerous when it's in the back of the enemy party is that it uses a move called Skewering Repartee, I think it's called. I don't have great pronunciation, so I apologize. But this is a lunge type of attack where it hits your entire team for solid damage, it also inflicts a bleed against them, and then it gives the Esquire repost afterwards, so he can do more damage. 
Preventing this move is why this unit has a very high threat level once it's in the back, because it does a lot of damage, it's a pain to deal with, so you should be trying to either push enemies behind it to pull it forward so it can't use the move, or stun it until you're ready to deal with it. Or kill it first. I know I said manservants should go down first, but honestly if there's an esquire in the back, it is a very valid choice to kill first if you feel like you need to. Courtesans are support units for Crimson Court enemies. They kind of do some disruptive stuff, they buff and they drop horror debuffs, but none of it is really super threatening. Usually you can just kill these in like one or two hits anyway, so if you just feel like you need to get rid of a body, then go ahead and do it. The one thing to watch out for is that they can buff their allies damage with Midnight Minway, which is a dance type of thing. So it'll move everyone into position, or rather it'll move everyone into new positions, it'll shuffle the entire party. And the times this can get dangerous is like if it buffs up a Chevalier that's about to attack you, or if it takes an Esquire from the front, puts it in the back with a damage buff, and then it skewers you. That's when it gets pretty dangerous, so if you can avoid that situation, then the threat level on this enemy is very low. The final regular enemy that we can talk about for Courtyard are Chevaliers, aka Chevs. They are very easy to spot, they're giant bugs with powdered wigs that sit on rocks, and they have cool looking coats, and they only have two moves. They have a move that stuns you, and they have a move that bleeds you. The stun attack called Buried Blast has a slightly lower than average stun chance, but has a nasty debuff of minus 50 dodge, and it hits two people, but it can't crit. Their other attack called Subterranean Skewer can only hit one target. The damage is pretty solid, this move can crit, it can only hit one person. It also attaches a bleed, plus a debuff that lowers your bleed resist, so if this dude decides to hit the same person two or three times, it's gonna get a lot of damage. As dangerous as Chevaliers are, they're pretty beefy and hard to get rid of in like two turns, so it's usually better to just stun them and let them sit there because their stun resist is pretty low. So you stun them once, you may be able to double stun them, and then after that you should clean up the rest of the enemies. They may get one attack because you're still getting rid of the other enemies on the team, and then once it's down to just by itself, you try and stun lock this thing until you kill it. This is also the enemy where when we talked about Occultist and Leopard together, that this enemy actually gets neutered by this combo, so you can spam Weakening, Curse, and Intimidate, and then all this dude is doing is occasionally stunning you, and then doing a bit of bleed damage that someone like Plague Doctor can cure. So even though this thing is dangerous, it puts out a lot of damage, if you have a strategy in place to deal with it, it's not that bad besides the fights where three of them can spawn at the same time. We'll talk about the bosses here, and just a couple easy tips for strategies and team building. When you're fighting Crocodilian, this is a boss that shows up a few times, it only has a few attacks and it follows a set pattern, so once you understand these, the fight gets a little bit easier. And really this fight is just akin to trying to prevent a bomb from going off. That bomb is Apex Predator, this move hits ridiculously hard, especially because Croc gives itself a buff before it doesn't, but you can always tell when it's trying to do it. So once you recognize that and disrupt it, the fight gets incredibly tame. It always follows the same pattern of when it's in either rank 1, which is the very front of the enemy formation, or when it's in rank 4, which is the very back, and it's got the reeds around it, it moves between them. So once it's in either 1 or 4, it can do Swarming Corruption if it's in rank 4. That's a move that is a cleave that does stress damage. The damage is pretty moderate. And then if it's up front, it has a move called Teeth Rake, which pulls a unit forward and then inflicts bleed on them. Either the use of bleed resist trinkets or holy water is advised for this attack. After it gets bored of using those moves, it will use something called Lurking Fear, which moves it either back or forward into the middle of the enemy formation. And this is when you need to move the croc out of that spot, either with some kind of pull or some kind of push. It looks like a big hulking creature, but it actually has very low move resist. The reason you want to move it out of these spots is because after it uses Lurking Fear and gives itself a buff, it uses another ability called Submerge. It may do a Teeth Rake or Swarming Corruption in between this, but it will use Submerge, which gives it an absolute ton of dodge and prots, and then it also heals it, and then it sits there. Once it is used Submerge, do your best to get as much healing on everyone as possible, and then use any defensive thing you can. If you have buffs, use those. If you have Aegis scales, they may be worth pressing. And then if you can stun it with someone else's turn, try and do that just to slow it down. But honestly, you're about to get hit for a lot of damage. Once it is submerged, it uses an attack called Apex Predator. I'm pretty sure this is a reference to Randy Orton, the professional wrestler. And then this move can hit either one person or two if you're an apprentice, or can hit three once you're a veteran and champion. And this move hits ridiculously hard. One of the pictures my Discord passes around is when I fought Crocodilian and it used Apex Predator. It crit three people that it hit, 
and it would have done 99 damage across all three people had I not had protection on my Jester. So the way Crocodilian kills you is it gets into position, it uses Apex, and then it hits you with like Teeth Rake afterwards and you die to the bleed. Characters you should consider fighting Crocodilian with are Shieldbreaker because she can pull very easily, Bounty Hunter because you can push it very easily, and then Occultist and Plague Doctor both do pretty okay with their pulls and Disorienting Blast is a bit random but it can high roll and push it into one of the good positions that you want Croc to be in and then stun it. So that's what I was alluding to before, it doesn't really matter who your damage dealers are or your support units are, Vessel's a bit harder to run against Croc because it can pull her up front, but once you have some kind of movement and you can pull or push Croc out of submerge range, then this fight gets much, much easier. It isn't too difficult to survive an Apex Predator if something goes wrong, but honestly if Croc is getting this off every couple turns, you're gonna feel it and you're probably gonna be dying. Direct damage works fine against Croc, even Leper against its proc can hit hard enough that it doesn't matter too much, Shieldbreaker can armor pierce, and then any type of bleed damage is usually solid enough. Like if you can stun Croc up front and hit it with bleed out and it crits, it's gonna go down pretty quickly. Baron may be the best fight in the entire game. It is a very fun boss fight to do, so if you don't want to get spoiled on it, then just pause the video here. Otherwise, let's break down how Baron works. The Baron fight follows a three-act structure, so it is very clearly denoted by calling it the first, second, and third act. So when you start fighting Baron, it does kind of a shell game type of thing where it spawns four eggs on the field, and each one of these eggs has a monster inside. One of these has the Baron inside of it, the rest of them have either a Supplicant, a Sycophant, or a Chevalier. There's no way to tell what you're going to pop when you hit it, you just have to hit it and hope you get the monster you want. There are two different ways to handle this fight. The first and preferred method is to burst him down. This is because you cannot heal with the egg's presence, which means you can't stall off one egg while you kill things slowly. So it is better to try and just find the Baron as soon as possible and bring a ton of damage to the fight and annihilate him every time he pops up and force him into his HP threshold so he keeps going to the next act. This is why the aforementioned team of Plague Doctor, Jester, Occultist, and Leper is very good because if you can get Leper bloodlusted from Crimson Curse, you can then hit him with Plague Doctor's Emboldening Vapors to give him some extra damage while he revenges and just ramps up to a ton of extra damage. And then once he has all that stacked on top of him, he's going to be chewing through Baron very quickly. Even if you don't get Baron from the first egg, Leper will be able to rip through whatever pops out of there, whether it be a Mosquito or even a Chevalier. For Jester in this fight, I would recommend taking off Inspiring Tune, just because there's no point to stress healing unless you're really just close to Heart Attack or something like that and you're really pushing the envelope. So instead, put on Slice Off and Finale. At some point in the fight, Baron will most likely pull Jester forward one spot and give you a free Finale. Plague Doctor and Occultist can keep your team safe by locking down enemies with stuns, healing dots, and healing just raw HP damage with weird reconstruction. It's even worse stunning Baron with Occultist because it's very easy for him to do so, and if you stun Baron on his first turn before he gets to do anything, he recovers on his first action, loses the stun resist buff on the second action, and then you can stun him again right after if you need to. After Leper is juiced up, he will end the fight very quickly, especially if he scores a couple of critical hits. Many other combinations of characters work, such as Highwayman with Repost, especially if you have two of them, because Baron likes to cleave your team very frequently, so you just get a bunch of counterattack damage. You can run a heavy bleed setup, because any bleeds that you apply to the eggs will, for lack of a better term, bleed through to the enemy within, so you can stack bleed preemptively, and Baron with his three actions a turn gets ripped up by bleeds very quickly. The second strategy involves popping eggs and hoping you do not get Baron. So this way you can slowly control the fight, take down the threats, and then once Baron's there, you can start healing and recovering. This method is not as advised as the bursting down method. The bursting down method can seem a bit scary at first, but I do have a video on this channel of me getting stomped by Baron because I brought a safe team, which is why I don't recommend it. Regardless of the strategy you choose to employ on this fight, make sure that when you're popping eggs, you always pop the egg in the second position. The reason for this is most of your characters should have moves that hit rank 2. Sometimes they can hit rank 3, but universally 2 is the easiest spot to hit. Make sure you don't use any cleaves and good luck. If you manage to beat Baron, then there will be a red key in the room behind his boss room. And if you carry that red key all the way to the southern portion of the map, you'll be able to get yourself another Crimson Court Trinket. In a lot of cases, your team might be too torn up to go for it, or you may run out of food or something like that, but if you do provision correctly and you are able to get the key and you're healthy enough, then I would suggest going for it. Viscount is probably the easiest of the main three courtyard bosses, 
And like Baron, you can choose to either play around the mechanic, or you can just try and burst them down. If you're going to try and beat them by fighting the actual mechanic, which is killing the bodies, then there are a lot of teams that work pretty well, as long as you have some combination of control, some healing, and a bit of movement because he can move you around, then you should be fine. Highwayman and Flagellant, again, are very good picks in this fight just because of their bleed damage, but also Highwayman can attack from anywhere to hit most spots pretty easily, so he's really good here. And then, surprisingly, characters like Abomination are also very good. The order I prefer to kill the bodies in are the second body, then the first body, and the third body is the final one. The reason is the second body gives Viscount the biggest buff, and it's the biggest headache that you'll have in the fight. And it's also got a moderate amount of HP, so it's not too hard to get rid of in a turn or two. And then you have the front body, which is pretty weak and goes down quickly. This is mostly just to get Viscount up front, where you can reach him easily. And then after that, if you feel so inclined, you can kill the third body, and then kill Viscount afterwards. Because once he's out of bodies, the fight is really easy. If you're going for a burst damage type of strat, make sure you bring at least a stun just to lock him in place when you need to, alongside some heavy hitters that also have reach. Having Bloodlust Charge for Crimson Curse helps, and then this is where we can employ something like the Double Chug strategy and get even more bonus damage, and hopefully you just get some kind of big crit on turn 1, especially if you have something like Bleed Out, and then if you're able to do this, Viscount will go down relatively quickly, but with this strategy, I have had trouble myself in the past, just because Viscount got away from me, like I didn't get the crits I needed to, I did not do enough damage quickly, and then afterwards Viscount was able to recover and slowly kick the crap out of me. Countess is a rather difficult fight just because there's so many things she can do, she has a lot of HP and she can put out some serious damage and also disrupt your team with Stumble, which is her unique thing from Sway With Me. So all of that stuff together leads to a fight that is pretty dangerous and long. You can think of Countess as a fight of three different phases and she rotates between all of them pretty consistently, it's not like you get her to a set amount of HP and she changes. It's more like the Crimson Curse that affects the hero, so she starts off in kind of a passive phase where she has three attacks and three actions. The first one is Disrobe, which is a moderate damage attack. It just does damage and it hits you. She has Sway With Me, which applies a very devastating dot called Stumble, which is a movement type of dot. So for a set amount of turns, your teammates will wander around aimlessly once their turn comes up. And you can negate this by stacking move resist, which is why I will suggest heavy boots in a moment. And it also applies some strong blight and stresses your party. This move is very devastating. And this is one of the two moves that dictate what happens in this entire fight. Her other move in the passive state is Love Letter, where she injects an egg into your hero, and the egg will pop when you hit Countess, and it gives her a ton of protection for doing so. Which is why you want to make sure that your damage dealers do not get the egg as much as possible, which is why I will suggest Man at Arms for just about every comp possible for Countess. The goal is to have Man at Arms get hit by the egg, so this way your damage dealers don't have to pop it, take damage, and then give Countess a bunch of protection. Instead, you put it on Man at Arms, who just absorbs the egg, and then he just sits there with it because he never attacks in most comps, and then he just doesn't get to pop it, and give Countess protection. After a couple actions in this phase, she will use something called Flushed, where she turns into a kind of weakened state, which you can consider maybe either akin to Wasting or Craving, and this is her weakest state. Her resistances go down, she cures Blight and Bleed on top of herself, and if you're able to stun her in this state, then you're able to get more damage, which is one strategy to the fight. She only has two actions in the flush state, so she has momentary overexertion, where she buffs all of her resists, and then she has metamorphosis, which pretty much just never hits. I think it only has the flat 5% accuracy of never missing. That's the only time it can hit you. I've never actually been hit by this move, but when she uses metamorphosis, this is like the same thing as her transforming. So we've seen all the other Crimson Court enemies that drink blood before, they transform into just hideous monstrosities, and Countess does the same thing, again curing bleed and blight from her. Her bloodlust state is very dangerous, this is the most dangerous part of the fight, because for some reason, just the way the eggs work, this is usually when they start popping, so a Countess has four actions in this phase, so she's going quite often, she's doing a lot of different stuff, the eggs are popping at the same time, so it's kind of just this cluster mess of a phase, unless you know what you're doing and take it slowly. In this phase, she has Indecent Proposal, which is a cleave attack that hits your entire team. It scales down in damage as it goes further into your party, so the person at the back takes the least damage, but also hits you for a decent bleed of 3 damage, and she has this as an option. She has Disrobe, much like she did in the first phase, so that's another attack that she has. Then she has the Thirst, so she can hit one of your units and heal herself for it, so she's able to get her HP back. This can prolong the fight, so you can see here, between her giant hit point pool, 
and having the ability to heal herself and then give herself protection. This fight can drag out for a while, and even though she only has 400 HP normally and then 500 at Stygian and Blood Moon, I guess it's only Blood Moon at that point because of the DLC. So because she has that much HP and then she has Prot and then she can heal herself, you can do upwards of like 5, 6, or 700 damage depending on the difficulty before Countess goes down. The final attack she has in this state is called Throws of Ecstasy, where she can hit one or two targets and stun them. This can be pretty bad, especially if she stuns your man at arms that you're trying to use to guard your damage dealer, and then she transforms back, and then she hits them with Love Letter. That can kind of suck, but if you're able to survive all of that, she will eventually use Courtship Renewed, which puts her back into her passive state, and the whole dance type of fight starts again. If you want to fight her straight up, there are a few good teams to do it, but honestly, I feel like the most consistent core involves having Flagellant, Man in Arms, and Vestal. The reason for this is Flagellant can hit her back with Exsanguinate and use Redeem on your teammates if he needs to, so he's got a lot of supplemental healing. He can also move forward three spots, so if he gets knocked out of position, he can always run back up to the spot that he needs. And then you have Vestal and Man in Arms who provide really good utility alongside their guards and heals. And then after that, your choice of fourth person is pretty much up to you. I've had success with Houndmaster, I've seen success with Hellion. Highwayman is actually not advised because there are a lot of things you can't repost in this fight. So really, any person that can do decent damage from most of the field should do okay. If your team has access to a stun, you can also try and stun her in her flush state, which is her weakest state, and prolong that just a bit more to get more damage and not have to deal with the other shenanigans. I mean, sure, you can do this fight normally where you bring some heroes and beat her to death and you trade hits and you try and heal and then someone goes to death's door and it's all dramatic. You could do all of that, but why would you? Which is why I'm going to propose this strategy, which came from Midnight and Thick, who were able to hash this out, and it is the most consistent Countess boss killing strategy I have ever seen, and it involves heavy boots. All you need are characters like we talked about before, such as Vestal, Man in Arms, and Flagellant. These three, again, are good for the same reasons we talked about before. And then you have some kind of hyper damage dealer like Leper or Hellion. This is also one of the few times you can run Man in Arms in rank 4 with Guardian Shield to great effect. The strategy is very simple. You have a bunch of heavy boots on your team, so you can't get pushed around by Sway With Me. It also helps to camp and give Leper the Bloody Shroud camp buff. Because of these trinkets and that camp skill, you only gate the hardest part of the fight, which is the stumble debuff, so your party won't be constantly moving around and tripping all over themselves. The second thing you need to do is use Man at Arm's first turn to guard Leper. And this is because you don't want Leper to get hit with Love Letter and receive a Parasitic Egg. Because Love Letter pops when you hit the boss, it gives her prod and it does damage to your units. Love Letter is how she gets most of her damage in this fight. It's okay if Flagellant gets Love Letter in this fight because he's able to exsanguinate and redeem to bounce his HP back up to full, but Leper, you don't want him to get hit with it, or Hellion or whoever your hyper carry is, just because you want them focused on doing as much damage as possible and not having to take turns off to worry about dying. You will never attack with Man in Arms or Vessel, so the only person giving her Love Letter is Flagellant. So between not being able to get moved and not taking a bunch of damage on each of your heroes because you're attacking her, the fight gets much, much easier. Again, Bloodlust and Double Chug is in fact encouraged on your damage dealer just to make the fight go that much faster. The time I used this strategy, and I will link the video down below of me doing it, I was able to take down Countess in about 7 turns on Blood Moon where she has almost 500 HP. Either way, it doesn't really matter which strategy you choose to use as long as you can employ one of these, and the same core concepts are there. You need to have some kind of plan that deals with Sway With Me and Love Letter, and once you figure out those two things and have a consistent amount of damage and recovery, the Countess should fall to your might. I know I said that there are two strategies, but there's actually one more that I completely forgot just because I've never used it, but I've seen people use it, and that is just to get a ton of dodge spam. The easiest way to do this is to use Man at Arms and one or two Antiquarians with Dodge Vapors, and then Camp to get Tactics, and then bring a bunch of Shard Dust to get your dodge up to ridiculous levels, and at that point Countess only has a 5% chance to hit you, which makes the fight a complete joke. As I said, I'm not a particular fan of that strategy, but as a content creator making guides, it is my duty and responsibility to give you all options conceivably available to you. There's the potential to get a couple more Crimson Court Trinkets on the Countess map after you beat her, but honestly it's not worth doing because you're about to open the Garden Guardian, which is much easier to farm and you don't have to deal with Crocodilian. Once you've beaten the Countess, you get a repeatable boss mission where you have to fight something called the Garden Guardian. This is a big statue, and it gives you one Crimson Court Trinket for beating it, and then it gives you another one as a mission reward. So you use this boss in order to fill out the rest of your CC sets, because sometimes you just want to farm them up, and that's completely cool. 
And honestly, this boss sucks big time. It's a normal, just pre-generated, not even pre-generated, it's a normal, randomly generated dungeon of medium length, and then after a certain point, all the same mechanics apply, like the boss is in the farthest room. You get to the boss, you're able to camp before then, and then you fight the boss, you kill the boss, you get the stuff. There isn't really much to this fight, because it has three parts. So it has a hand, that has a spear, it has the middle body part, and then it has the shield. The shield just jumps up and down constantly and stuns your frontline. The spear in the back does a lot of damage. And then the body in the middle does nothing until the shield dies. It's advised that when you're fighting this boss that you kill the hand first and then try and kill the body before killing the shield and then kill the shield last because if you kill the shield first you're going to take a ton of damage from the super move that it has because it's pissed off that you killed the shield. This fight is a complete slog because it takes so long to do and then you have to repeat it a bunch of times. I'm actually kind of salty that Red Hook made the final formable fight that you have to do to get Crimson Core Trinkets. One of the longest potential fights in the game, because this thing has a massive amount of protection, it has a bunch of resistances so you can't hit it with status, which means you have to either bring armor piercing or mark. My preferred team to fight this boss is honestly two shield breakers, a vessel, and a plague doctor. Plague doctor does okay to get you there by being able to stun all the random stuff in courtyard with the dazzling mirror, and then you have two shield breakers that have armor piercing on pierce, and they can reach into rank 4, so they can kill the hand first, and then they can puncture the boss, to open it up from the shield and then hit the body at will and then when the shield comes back down then you have to deal with that again then you can puncture the boss and then just kill the boss very safely before killing the shield it also helps that you have plague doctor who is able to use emboldening vapors to buff up the damage of the two shield breakers and honestly at that point it's a matter of just not dying to the shields attack because that's pretty hard to do keeping your units topped off and then watching the two shield breakers kill the enemy because honestly the plague doctor and the vessel won't be doing too much damage Make sure to give one of your shield breakers the sculptor's tools if you are able to find them. If you do not have the Crimson Court DLC, you can use Grave Robber who has Pick to the Face, which is an armor piercing move. And then like I said, you can use Marks, so a lot of Mark teams like Bounty Hunter or Houndmaster or Arbalest, all of these do just fine as long as you're patient and you take the damage when you can and you don't kill the shield first so you don't get hit by the super move. The last boss that we're going to talk about is the Fanatic, and honestly this boss is not worth fighting at any point for any reason, unless you just want the achievement, but this boss sucks. Its only purpose is to punish you for bringing cursed heroes into dungeons and not going to fight the Crimson Court bosses. It gives you a very garbage reward of just a bunch of crests and the cure, which lets you cure Crimson Curse on your units, it's just a potion you drink. And besides that, there's no point to fighting this boss. It's incredibly lethal, it's dangerous, it can be really annoying, every time you start the fight it surprises your party, and there aren't really many good strategies for fighting him. The fight plays out like a super version of Hag, where instead of a crockpot to get thrown in, the Fnatic has a pyre that he puts your units on and it does the same type of mechanic where it's percentage damage across the entire turn, so eventually they take enough damage to fall off and then they're in danger of dying. But unlike the Hag, which doesn't have a lot of lethality, even if you're a Death Store, the Fnatic is incredibly lethal, so once your dude pops off the pyre, he's able to kill it sometimes pretty effectively. Also, unlike the Hag, the Fnatic moves back and forth, so if you don't have reach into rank 3, then you're pretty much SOL. And you have to choose either between destroying the Pyre or just trying to kill Fnatic outright and ignoring the boss mechanic. The best advice I can give you, because I really don't have a team to offer, is just any units that can do a lot of damage quickly and are able to move around. Bleed also helps, even though Fnatic does have a solid amount of bleed resist. He does have 3 actions a turn, so if you're able to stick things like Open Vein and Punish, for instance, then you will be doing a lot of damage quickly, but he's going to be doing a lot of damage too at the same time, so it's kind of hard to do the damage, keep the person off the pyre, and survive, and then keep everyone healed. This fight is just such a mess, which is why I really recommend just not doing it. Besides that though, I think Highwayman's pretty good in this fight, Flagellant's pretty good in this fight, Shieldbreaker, Grave Robber, characters that can move around and still do damage are pretty good, and then healers that can heal from anywhere, so not Vestal, that means you're probably looking at Crusader, Flagellants, or even Occultus. Those units can heal from anywhere, and that's good enough. So if you have some kind of combination like that, and a bit of luck, because it does feel like a bit of luck is required in this fight, you'll probably kill Fnatic, but it might take you a couple tries, just because he's really annoying and very challenging. Alright y'all, that's going to do it for this one. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below under the video. If you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Be sure to check out the description box below as well for all the cool social media stuff like Discord, Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon. All that is greatly appreciated, and there's something cool for you if you choose to explore those things. Hopefully it wasn't too much information overload, and you could probably consider this the precursor to the Region Guide series, 
that I'm going to be working on here over the next few weeks. And we're not going to go as in-depth in the other places just because there's not as much complexity to them, but we will cover the enemies and some strategies and the bosses. So look forward to all of that, and those should be coming up soon, TM. You know, it's just a matter of writing them and then recording all of that. Anyway, that's it for this one, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.